Hi, everyone. Hi. Just kind of a heads up, I'm I'm recovering from a bout of uh, bronchitis, so my voice is a little bit raspy right now. <laughs> And then I'm sure I'm sure that Zoom already kind of warned everybody as you came in. Um, Kasha did ask me to record the session because there are a few people that are unable to make it today. Um, I'm just going to pop open the participants thing. We may have some people join us like a little late. I'm not 100% sure, but we'll we'll give it like a couple more minutes just to see if anybody else joins us a little bit late. Um, and then we'll get started. But um, yeah, just so you know, we, we will be recorded. And just to kind of give everybody like a little bit of a, not like an agenda per se, but just like a little bit of a heads up towards the end of the workshop, we do have kind of like a little bit of a journal and share back. It's not like a full circle because this is only 90 minutes. So we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, but I've, I'll pop the questions into the chat right now. And the questions will make a lot more sense, like as we're going through the workshop. So don't, if you're, if you're reading them and you're like, this doesn't make any sense, please don't worry about that. Um, but for people who kind of need like a little bit more time to process questions, I'm just going to put them into the chat now. And then that way you have some time to think about them and they're not just like thrown at you towards the end of the workshop. Um, but this is just, you'll have like kind of like five minutes to like journal and then an elective share back. Like you don't, not everybody has to share if you're not comfortable, but these are kind of like some of the, I shouldn't say kind of, these are the, the things that we talk about um, in cultivating safe spaces. We'll be talking about something called the four perspectives, four conditions and four protocols. And then um, we'll talk about some uh, lateral violence, and vicarious trauma, a tool called Who Am I? What's in My Heart? And then we'll go into that, the journal and share back portion. Um, got a couple, couple people joining us a little bit late. I'll go ahead, I'll share my screen. Let's just see. There we go. Can I just get a thumbs up if that looks good? Awesome. All right. So I'm just gonna we'll just slowly get started. I'll just I'll just start introducing myself. Obviously, I'm Jen Greenway. <laughs> um, I'm also uh my my indigenous name is Tal Tama, so that loosely translates to woman who comes from the land that belongs to the wolves. I'm Teltan and I'm Kaska. That is a Teltan name, and I was. I was given that name at our most recent potlatch, so I'm just, I'm growing into it, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of, like, what my family thinks of me. I guess they think I'm a pretty unruly person. I always thought I was pretty reserved, but, you know, I'll, I'll trust our judgment. Um, whoops. So this is kind of, I guess, like, my, I used to have, like, this big, long introduction uh like the the traditional one like I can obviously I obviously still go into it like my dad is Bill Greenway he's pictured here my mom is Leah Greenway she's a settler um on my dad's side that's my indigenous side so his mother is Violet Greenway his dad uh is Robert Greenway the senior and then uh, both of them are passed unfortunately so this potlatch is the settlement feast for my grandmother and then um, my grandfather just recently passed and so we just had his uh, feast this past weekend but I wasn't even allowed to go because I have bronchitis and they were like you're too sick <laughs> so it was really sad um, but the the introduction that I, I used to go through was this like really long introduction that feels kind of performative now and um, I'm not 100% sure why. And I think ultimately what it comes down to is this idea of when my grandmother passed away, there was a really large shakeup of um, roles and, and identities like in our family as, as that kind of comes to be as everyone's shifting around to find their new role in the family. And I still haven't quite found mine. <laughs> so... I, I used to have this beautiful long introduction and then now it just feels like it's I'm still kind of learning it so when I go through this introduction I like to just kind of start with you know who am I and who do I belong to and 
who ultimately who I belong to is uh, the Wolf Clan, the uh, Telkutena Clan, or the Telkutena House in Teltan Nation. And uh, this is one of my absolute favorite photos here. And so I just like to ground myself with this. But uh, you can call me Jen, you can call me Telkutena. And hopefully throughout this workshop, like I like to share a few stories and things and you'll kind of get an idea of who I am. Uh, this unfortunately is like a very, very short workshop. It's 90 minutes. It's like the what I like to call the speed run of the workshop that I usually do, which is like four to six hours. So unfortunately, we don't really get a lot of time to like do a lot of back and forth and a lot of breakouts and things like that. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to just kind of blitz through it. But uh, what is Cultivating Safe Spaces? I don't know if anybody has taken a Cultivating Safe Spaces workshop with me or with Elaine or with any other uh, Cultivating Safe Spaces facilitators. There are over 100 of us now. I'm one of the first ones to get um, certified because I worked directly with Elaine. I was one of her assistants, which is incredible. She's as amazing as you would think if you've if you've ever seen her online or anything like that. She is. She's fantastic. Um, but we all have kind of our own niche and cultivating safe spaces is ultimately a set of tools that kind of I, how I like to describe them. They aid you in finding your place in reconciliation and or just in having difficult conversations and managing being triggered or managing trauma. Um, I personally like to start with something called the four perspectives. So we're going to jump into that now. And this is kind of the one that I like to spend the most time on because it really helps you kind of ground yourself and find yourself and your identity in cultivating safe spaces. It makes it accessible. So we'll we'll jump into that one. And like I said, this is the speed run. So please bear with me. I know it's going to be a lot of information kind of thrown at you at once. And I do also just want to really quickly caveat. I do have a podcast. So there, I have two podcasts, actually, um, although they are kind of on a hiatus again after I lost my grandpa. We had to. <laughs> I've been... <laughs> But taking a step back, um, so there's the Ghost Mind Yourself podcast and there's the Cultivating Safe Spaces podcast. So if you are somebody who is like, this is way too much information, I need to revisit this. I always send out the slides afterwards. And there's also um, episodes on each of these topics. So you can revisit them. You can, you know, reprocess them as much as you need to. Um, this can really be as deep or as shallow as you're ready to take it. So we'll go into the four perspectives really quickly here. Um, what I wanted to show you really quickly, and again, like I said, I'll send you all of these slides. So please do not feel like like you have to like take all of this in right right now. But each slide that you're going to see is going to show you the perspective, which you can see here on the circle. We've got tradition, relationship, innovation, and action. And then you're also going to see how they communicate their communication style, problem solving techniques, and what the perspective needs to feel safe. I also like to throw in like keywords for people who are like, this is too much information. I want concise. Um, and those are things that like, if you can't remember at all, just remember the keywords and that'll be all you need. So what I also like to do is something that for some people, it's a little bit taboo. I also like to break the circle. Um, instead of going tradition, relationship, innovation, action, I jump across, I do tradition and innovation. And then I do relationship and action. And I do that very specifically so that you can see something, what I consider to be a false dichotomy. And we'll talk about the false dichotomies after we talk about all of the perspectives. Um, and we'll kind of break that down a little bit. And we'll talk about um, this colonial mentality that each perspective is put opposite each other on the circle when they don't work well together, when in reality, they're meant to balance it, each other out. So we'll we'll start with the uh, tradition, like I said, and then we'll talk about innovation next. So the first thing that I like to find out, I know this is a lot of information. The first thing I like to point out about tradition perspectives is that you do not need to be indigenous to be a tradition person. I The, the word tradition can always kind of throw people off who are not indigenous, but it's just it's just the word that we use. <laughs> and so who are tradition people? These are knowledge keepers, storytellers, corporate knowledge holders. These are people who really enjoy mentoring people. What I like to like to tell people about tradition people, if, if we have to kind of get down to it, is if you could visualize a tradition person as like a human library. These are the people who have so much information stored in their head. They're full of stories. They're full of information. They're full of context. And they're the person who 
if you have to kind of go to their office or if you have to, <clears throat> sorry, if you have to go to their house, you can expect to be sitting down for tea. You can expect them to ask you to sit down at their desk, close the door, have a conversation. So if you're if you're one of the other perspectives, if you're like, wow, I really don't have time to kind of go over to so-and-so's house, so maybe I should do that tomorrow, they're probably a traditional person. If you're somebody who's like, oh my God, that person talks way too fast, I just can't even keep up with them, you might be a tradition person. So their communication style is is a story for everything, right? They take a lot of time because they need to process it. And it's largely because, again, if you think of these people largely like a library, they have to go, they have to find the book, they have to find the page, and then they have to read out all of that context versus somebody, and this will make more sense when we talk about an action person. If we were to talk about an action person, it's bullet point, right? Story versus bullet point. So the tradition person, there's a lot of context and they, they really do need that time to be able to bring that context to light. So the problem solving techniques, again, these lessons and solutions come from history, they, they come from traditional knowledge, Storytelling is a chance to teach and think and connect the dots. And that and they really do stress that that knowledge requires context because if they tell a story and they don't get all of the context, it's very easy to misinterpret that story. Right. And that's that's a traditional perspective's worst nightmare is that they just give you information and then you run with it and it's it's incorrect. So they really want people to be able to slow down and listen. And so what what that ultimately boils down to for them to feel safe is that they require a lot of time to be able to just kind of hang out, swap stories and be able to um, really validate that knowledge preservation that's taking place. And it, and it is a gift for them. It's not um, that I, I just to kind of sidestep when we talk about each perspective, we really are highlighting gifts that each perspective brings to the circle. Right. So for a traditional perspective, their gift is that knowledge preservation. And so in order for them to really be at their best and for them to be able to contribute their best, they need to be able to have time to really bring those stories to life and really bring each detail to life. So when you tell a traditional perspective that you don't have time for them or that you don't have time for their stories or that you can't sit down and chat with them, you don't have time for tea, that's essentially invalidating their gifts and telling them that that what they have to offer is not uh, valuable. So the keywords here that I, I like to use are preservation, storytelling, culture, and history. Um, when we jump across the when we jump across the circle, we'll be talking about innovation. Uh, and you can see again, we have this we'll talk about false dichotomies at the get at the end, but I want you to kind of picture this idea, this colonial mentality that they're put opposite the circle because they don't work well together and we'll kind of debunk that. But just kind of keep this in mind, this idea of preservation, storytelling, culture, history. We have everything that we need here. Um, this idea of mother knows best, let's go back to the land, everything is in our stories. And then we'll kind of um, contrast that with innovation in just a second here. Oh, I just dropped something. Um, okay, innovation is uh, on the on the bottom half of the circle. And so I personally fall very heavily into the innovation perspective and into the action perspective. And again, this will it'll all make sense in just a second. And for people who are like, I'm lost, I'll tie it all up like with a little bow at the end. So just trust the process it can seem kind of chaotic. Again, lots and lots of information, but I promise it'll all make sense. So just, just trust the process. So the innovation perspective, these are very creative system thinkers, right? Um, problem solvers. These are people who have very big visions for what the future holds and like eagerness, like they want bigger, they want better. Um, I, I always like to kind of give the example, like I'm the friend who you don't want to tell me what your goal, what your dream job is. Because if you're, if you're like, you know what, my dream is to own a coffee shop. The next day I've already looked up to see if there are like open business for rent. Right. Like I've looked up like the retail in the area. I've Googled to see if the name, if your dream name is taken, if the like what the cost of the website domain would be. I've already done all the work for you because I'm so excited. I want you to have that dream. Right. I don't care how you're going to do it. I just want you to do it. So innovation people are the people who are like grandiose thinkers. Like, how can we make the system better? 
right? What we have is cool. How can we make it better? And you can kind of, if you're already thinking about that tradition, innovation kind of thing, you can see where in a colonial society, they might butt heads. Tradition is like, we're good where we are. Innovation is like, but how can we build it? Like, let's go bigger. Let's go better. The communication style for innovation is kind of unique, right? They're actually full of questions and they, they need a lot of time to process. So usually I like to say if you, for innovation people, if you ask them a question, they'll probably answer with questions. And so they're, they're kind of unique in a sense that a lot of the time, if you go into a meeting with an innovation person, you feel like you've gotten nothing done because you've answered no questions in your mind. But in their mind, they're like they've had so much clarification because they've had a chance to ask a bazillion questions themselves and get clarification. But you walk away thinking nothing's happened. So they're they're a very unique uh, perspective in that in that right. And a lot of people don't realize that their innovation perspectives because they are so kind of flighty in terms of how they think. They they're hard to pin down, and their problem solving techniques are again. They're the post-it people. They're the brainstorming people. They're the the people who, if you gave them a big whiteboard, they're kind of like drawing lines and things. I like to, is it is it Charlie Day, the guy who has like that meme where he's like, ah, and he's got like all the lines and stuff. That's, yeah, that's an innovation person where he's like, look at this. Like that's innovation. Lots of questions, lots of check-ins. And what they need to feel safe, the innovation person needs the most time out of any perspective because they shut down. So if you require information right away, if you come up to an innovation person, and like even if you're like, hey, I need your Starbucks order right now, an innovation person is like immediate shutdown. Like, I can't think about that. Just just order me something. I don't know. Like, I'm allergic to milk. Just choose something that doesn't have milk, I guess. They need time to think about it. And then when you're gone and the pressure's off, they'll probably text you like, actually, I want this kind of thing because they just can't in the face of that pressure, they can't, their brain just can't handle it. Um, and like true innovation people, it could take like a week for them to think of things. It's, it's very, um, it's very funny to like work with a team of innovation people because they might get into a meeting and they're all like vibing and they think they've got all these great ideas. And then a week later they come back and it's like a completely different project <laughs> because all of their ideas came like when they got home, like very, very cool perspective. Um, so their gift is again, like those, that huge expansive creativity. So you've got the, the knowledge keeping for tradition, expansive creativity for innovation. And then those keywords are like a, the system thinkers, problem solving and growth. Um, and then when we, when we go, we're jumping back up. So again, we jumped across the circle. Now we're going back up to the top right corner here. We're going to talk about relationship people. Relationship people, um, I like to, I, I had this like analogy that I used all the time. And I feel like the, the further I get from when this movie came out, the less people have watched it. Have, has anybody watched the movie Trolls? No, right? Like, I feel like nobody's watched it. We have four kids. Um, I've, I've watched yeah, the little trolls with the hair. Yeah. And they're like super happy. They're they're relationship people where they're like, a hug time, hug time, hug time. Like those are relationship people. This idea of like nobody left behind. And they're like always like, ah, kind of thing. Relationship people. So the relationship people are like this idea where like they view their world through like their interconnections, like everything about if you ask a relationship person, like who they are, everything about them is like who they know. It's very interesting. My mom is like a classic relationship person and I've, I've witnessed her introduce herself. I don't even know, like, you know, millions of times at this point. And she'll be like, hi, my name is Leah. I have four kids. I have four grandkids. And she, and everything that she says is about, oh, whoops, sorry is about like who she knows right um yeah <laughs> see trolls um everything is about like who she knows and like uh who she volunteers with or, or different things like that so the relationship people are very interesting because their identity is this interconnected web and it's their gift is very much this ability to um participate in emotional labor and to uphold um the atmosphere of a space 
it's very incredible. Like they participate in it without even realizing that they're doing it. So I, I really do like when I talk about relationship perspectives, I really have to kind of like stop and, and ho like hold my hands up to these people because a lot of their labor gets dismissed and get, and look, when we think about the connotation of like the chatty Kathy in the workspace, right? The, the girl, specific, specifically the girl, because if a guy does it, people don't, don't really bat an eye the girl who goes around with her coffee and like checks on people in the morning and they're like, Oh, she never works. Um, or maybe like the secretary who's like always like chatting with people, that connotation of like people who are not working, we have to kind of flip that script, right? Because the emotional labor of upkeeping the atmosphere in an office, I can guarantee that those relationship people, they're the people who can tell you whose mom is unwell they can tell you who just got a puppy. They can tell you whose child is entering kindergarten. And with all of that information, they can also tell you which people are not the right people to take on extra work. They can tell you who's in a good place to take on, you know, a little bit of extra work in uh, to help cover somebody. Just all, they are amazing for kind of spotting weaknesses in terms of like, who needs support and who's feeling great. Whereas when we talk about action people, action people, I'm an action person. I'm action innovation. We don't spot that. It's not natural for us. Like I have to work on it to be able to see it. Like I've come a long way in my cultivating safe spaces journey, but prior to that, I was blind to it, you know, like it, again, it'll make sense when we talk about action. Um, but the, the relationship people, it's a very natural thing for them to nurture. And that is our gift. So um, I talk about uh, maintaining the spirit and intent of good work, this idea of this active relationship building, their communication style is um, inclusive, right? They're, they're always, I, I already said this, but they tell you who they know, right? They want to, they want a chance to talk to everybody. Problem solving techniques are really cool because it's a consensus basis. Um, if there's a vote and there's, it's a four to five vote, they're like, half the population isn't happy. We're not doing this. So they make sure that there's no voices that are lost or silenced. And what they need to feel safe is this idea that they need to check in on everyone because it's going to be nagging them. They're like, you know what? I remember last week so-and-so wasn't doing so well. I need to make sure that they're doing better this week. But then at the same time, who's checking in on them? Right? So we have to always make sure that that emotional labor isn't solely falling on the relationship person and that we're also upholding that space that's safe for them. And so the keywords that I like to use here are relationship building, obviously, interconnected, deep bonds and inclusion. And then jumping across, we have action. And if you're an action person, I like to say that like by now you're like, I know I'm an action person. We get it. This is, <laughs> we get it. Okay. Like bullet point, let's move on. Um, I, like I said, I'm personally in action. I fall very heavily in the bottom of the circle, action, innovation. My boss, uh, when I worked with Elaine, she is tradition relationship. So we balance each other out really, really well. Um, these people are like efficient, fast working. We don't like to waste time. I always like to say these people are very akin to um, like salmon. If you like the salmon swimming upstream, if you can picture all the energy that it takes for a salmon to swim upstream and they're constantly like battering their bodies to get like up uh, the waterfalls or swimming up against like really strong currents, all of that energy put in a person and that's their gift, right? This forward movement. And so uh, the unfortunate thing is that colonial society really rewards action perspectives because that forward movement is very conducive to productivity, which is really conducive to capitalism, which is colonialism. <laughs> so the action perspective gets used and abused without them realizing it and it gets upheld. So if you can, if you can kind of identify that in yourself, just be aware of it because it's not healthy for the people around you, but it's also not healthy for you. We get burned out very easily because we are put in a position where we're used, right? Our productivity is pushed and pushed and pushed. So the communication style that we have, usually very blunt, usually very direct. We can be considered rude. This is something that like, um, sorry, I've got bronchitis, just 
Just one second here. I had like a cold like two weeks ago and it's just like it refuses to go away. Um, it's clinging on there. <laughs> um, but this is this is something that I've personally been working on for the past, I would say like the past like 15 years is like my bluntness. My my mom has always been like, you are just a little, a little bit too blunt. And that's that's an action thing for sure. Uh, this idea that nothing frivolous needs to be included, need to know basis. But what action people don't realize is that what's a need to know basis for action people, because it's so concise and so like very direct for the rest of the perspectives, which need a lot of information, they feel cut off, right? They feel like cut out. They feel left out. They're like, what do you mean? I, I need more information. And the action person is sitting here like, I what? why do you need that information? Like, it's not for you. So there, there can be this kind of butting of heads when the working style, communication style, those gifts are not understood and they're not respected. So in terms of problem solving techniques, again, don't like to waste time, most direct, most efficient route. This is the one where they like to speed run. They like to vote. And so that's why, again, putting relationship opposite them on the circle with that consensus, that need to um avoid voting is so important because they balance each other out relationships slows them down and it's like okay enough like four to five is not a good vote that's not fair like we need a different solution um action is really interesting because they're the only one that doesn't need more time to feel safe they need less time right they want to know exactly what's expected of them they want to get their work done and they like a time frame and they like it's like very explicit guidelines and um, a lot of the time, what that comes down to can be uh, shame culture that's been internalized and this idea of productivity that's been kind of valued through Western society and without without the um, the awareness and the ability to um, to really like call that call that out. We don't we're not able to really understand that we're that it comes from a place of shame and this idea that we're scared to show up with work unfinished. Right, because we love to work, we love productivity, we love to get these things done. But then capitalism has seen that, and then it's been like, hell yeah, let's prey on that shame. Right. So the keywords I like to use are concise, efficient, direct, and ready to work. And then we're just gonna quickly talk about like some dichotomies here um, before we move on to the four conditions. But so when we look at the circle again, like we can see, we, we kind of did some, some jumping, right? We did tradition, we jumped across to innovation, we did relationship, we jumped across to action. And I do that very specifically so that people can really understand this idea of these false dichotomies. This, there's this running narrative that tradition is put opposite innovation because they don't work well together. And action is put opposite relationship because they don't work well together. And, and they stay as far away as possible. I like to flip that narrative because I think that it's colonial bullshit. And sorry, I like to swear. Um, I think it's jarring and it gets people's attention. <laughs> but I think that it's colonial bullshit. I personally think that they're put opposite each other on the circle because they perfectly balance each other out. And I'll, and I'll, I'll use tradition and innovation as as an example, largely because um, I like the I like the example of um, tradition being I like the example of like racism keeping tradition pre contact and we'll kind of explore explore that in terms of like reconciliation and stuff. So there is this racist notion that like traditionalism or traditional ecological knowledge ended at fourteen ninety two. Right. And that in order for traditional ecological knowledge to be traditional, that it can't have any sort of like modern context that we can't use like guns, that we can't use anything. You know, we're not allowed to use modern technology for things to be traditional. And so what I like to I like to call that out, first of all, and largely because if you really sit with the understanding or the belief that indigenous peoples have been here since time and memorial, this idea, if you really want to like swallow that and 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 really take that into your into your being, then you also have to accept that we've survived a lot, right? Like ice ages, famines, droughts, all sorts of things. And we would not be able to do any of that if we never updated 
all of our technology consistently, right? If we continue to do the same thing over and over and over, we would die out. <laughs> like we would not be able to survive. And so what was traditional was always contemporary. It was always innovative. And so the, and you're smart. You'll, you'll see where I'm going, right? The tradition people hold the knowledge. They are the, the library. They contain all of that's their gift. They're able to hold the stories. They're able to hold the information. I'm an innovation person. I can't do that. I have the most flighty brain on the planet. <laughs> I cannot. I I can like take in a bunch of information, be an expert on something for a very short period of time, and then my attention span is gone, and I'm on to the next thing. A tradition person, they hold it forever. They're like elephants. It's incredible. So they hold all that information. The innovation person updates it. They're constantly adding to it. Right. And that library is expanding, expanding, expanding. So these two are not on the same side of the circle because they're, they're just too powerful. They can't be next to each other. They have to be opposite each other. And the same goes for action and relationship. Action moves too fast. They need relationship to slow them down. Relationship moves slowly. They need action to speed them up to get the work done. They have to be balancing each other out. And so when you look at that, and you see that each perspective is placed on the circle very intentionally, then you can you can understand that favoring one perspective over the other just doesn't make sense. It just it it even when we talk about the idea that action is very heavily upheld in colonial society, that's why colonial society is sick, because three perspectives are silenced or are pushed aside. That's that's three quarters of the population is being silenced or pushed aside to uphold one style of work, right? So in order to kind of heal the land and in order to do that, the reconciliation process, what we have to do is stop heavily weighting action. And this is not to knock down action people. Again, like I'm an action person. We need to stop heavily weighting action in the sense of forcing everybody to work in action or validating action only and say, hey, your gifts and tradition, relationship and innovation you're allowed to sit in those. You're allowed to be in those. And we have to encourage people to follow their gut, follow their intuition and really sit back into those. So that I, I always kind of use the like a top analogy, like a spinning top. Right now, if we were a top, we're so heavily carved, like a wooden top carved into action and we're wobbling so all over the place. If we add more of that weight back into the other sections, then we spin evenly, right? So we need to add that weight back. So that's that's perspectives. Um, and I like to do perspectives first because, again, this idea of seeing yourself in cultivating safe spaces, it becomes accessible, right? If we jump into something else, it might feel a little overwhelming. Like we jump straight into understanding self and I'm like, look at your trauma. Then it's like, whoa, this is a little bit much. But like looking at perspectives, you can see yourself. This it, Maybe it only goes this deep. That's totally fine. If you decide to take it a little bit deeper, there you go. So we start with perspectives. And then the next one that we go on to is, is conditions. Just give me one second. It's just like clinging to me. Um, the next one that I like to talk about is uh, the four conditions here. And before, before we break down the four conditions, I just wanted to show you on on this JPEG, which is the JPEG I made on Canva. The first one, this like nice one that I showed you, um, Evelyn Alec made from Next Me. So she is a graphic designer. If you're ever looking for somebody to like make you a nice design, she takes commissions. She's amazing. <laughs> but this one I just I just quickly made up. So I was like, matches our colors, it's fine. Um, so if you look at the center there, understanding self, love-based practices, patience, discipline, you see a nested system, right? Um, concentric circles. This idea that everything is really like uh, enclosed, right? Everything is kind of enclosed within each other. And the cool thing about a nested system is that anywhere that is impacted is any anywhere that you impact, it's going to impact the rest. Kind of similar to if you were to go to a lake and drop like a really big rock on the water and you've got those those ripples going out the biggest impact is always going to come from the center, but it doesn't mean that the rest are not linked, right? That ripple is still part of the lake. 
So when we go into the four conditions and we kind of break them down a little bit, I always like to just tell people start on the ground that, you know, start where you're comfortable. Cultivating safe spaces is supposed to be accessible. But if you're like, I want the biggest bang for my buck, go for the center because understanding self is like, that's, that's the big, big bucks right there. So the four conditions, understanding self is foundational, right? It's, it's the, it's the big, like the big portion. And when Elaine actually, actually when Elaine does this, she starts with understanding self and she can talk about understanding self for like a good 40 minutes and then just boom, 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 the rest out. I, again, like I start with perspective so that people will see themselves first. Um, but understanding self is, <laughs> it's the, it's the deep introspective portion. This is the part where I like to tell people, if you're somebody who's into yoga, if you're somebody who's into um, like Buddhism or, or anything that's kind of a spiritual practice already, this is the stripping away of the ego. This is um, understanding that you are a spiritual being or that you are, even if you're not spiritual or religious, this is you understanding that you are a conscious being and that you have something underneath the car underneath the clothes this is you underneath the image that you're trying to project and who are you at your core right and why are you that person at that core kind of if you were to if you're a knitter if you've ever seen like your grandma's sewing box and you pull out the string and it's like this horrifying like ball of yarn and you start to pull away at it and untangle it when you're pulling away at all of these different pieces and trying to untangle the yarn, what you're ultimately doing is kind of stripping away at each layer and, and holding it up and identifying why you enter a space the way that you do. And ultimately what that can look like is like, what are your traumas? It could be that deep. It could be what triggers you. It could be, um, did you sleep well, right? It doesn't have to go that deep. If you're not somebody who's like, I'm not, if, if you're somebody who's like, I'm not ready for that. It could be, do you sleep well? Do you eat well? Um, are you somebody who struggles with migraines? Like every little thing impacts who you are showing up in a space and understanding self is you ultimately coming to the awareness that you are one being and that every other being that you make eye contact with is separate from you and that they are having a different day from you and that you cannot control them and that they cannot control you and that when we meet together in a space we are both fully responsible for how we interact together and that if we're triggered cultivating safe spaces is not about removing triggers it's about us being aware of that we're triggered and learning to manage this and doing our best to work together to be respectful of each other um, unless we're saying like racist shit, that's un that's not acceptable, right? We're removing those things. But if I'm coming into a space and I say something very unintentionally that brings up a memory for somebody, we can't all of a sudden never talk about that because it triggers somebody. That's not what cultivating safe spaces is. I I once saw a, a quote that said, I'm grateful for my triggers because they show me where I'm not free. And so cultivating safe spaces, understanding self portion really is that it's this idea of understanding your triggers, who you are at your core and this intricate web of your being and what makes you the person that you are walking into a space. And that can and does include your perspective, which, by the way, your perspective, you don't have to choose just one. You can be a mix. You can shift throughout the day. That perspective can change depending on your mood, where you are at work all sorts of things. It's just another tool to kind of teach you who you are in that moment and how to be, um, how to manage yourself, right? Uh, we'll talk about love-based practices when we talk about four protocols, but basically what you need to know is this idea that it's showing up in every scenario with love and trust instead of the desire to control people, right? And this, this desire to control people is based in colonial society and they use very specific fear-based practices to control people and not just indigenous people but everybody and then we have patience um obviously this is patience for like per for other perspectives but this is also patience for yourself right and this idea that reconciliation is an ongoing 
project for every single person, not just reconciliation between um, quote unquote Canada and indigenous peoples, but also reconciliation within yourself as we decolonize because every single one of us is colonized. It's this great socialization project of the state. We're all racist, unfortunately. There's no way for us, it, it, I should say, it's not a moral failing, right, for us. It's a project by the state through education, through the media, through all the institutions that they have to teach us how to interact with ourselves and how to interact with each other and to teach us this hierarchical system that they have in place that serves them. We have to consciously unlearn it. And it takes a lot of patience and a lot of self-compassion and a lot of compassion with each other. So that's what the patience portion is. And again, I'm sorry, I have to like speed run this. I wish I could go into more examples. The discipline is ultimately this idea of like listening with discipline and holding space for people instead of listening and, and snap judgment. I've heard this before. That's hearing to respond. That's hearing with your triggers. That's hearing with your lens. The discipline is, again, removing that ego. Understanding self is finding that ego, unpacking that ego. The discipline is putting the ego aside so that you can hear somebody and hold that space for somebody. And the discipline is understanding that you do not need to like somebody to give them the space to be another being on this planet, another exp expression of spirit. Right, that they do not need to pass your judgment to deserve to be here and have space to speak. So discipline is this idea, again, hold space to listen, hold space uh, to, to love. Even if you don't like somebody, this idea of we're all spiritual beings, hold space to love and to recognize that people have the right to be here and to speak. Do not hold space, or sorry, do not... Um, listen with the intent to respond to weigh or judge and then we'll we'll jump into uh the four protocols <laughs> to just blast through this <laughs> i feel like i'm just like speed running um the, and the four protocols again these are the love-based practices so you can kind of see again in that nested system where if you can see my cursor i don't know if you can see my cursor we're like down in here the second second concentric circle so we're going to talk about promoting well-being inclusion validation and freedom and before we do that, I like to do something called the hotel analogy. And it's it kind of like jars people a little bit. So I want everybody to picture a hotel that is built by, sounds horrible, and it is. I want everybody to picture a hotel that is built by somebody who hates disabled people, like hates them. So they build the hotel. There's no ramps. There's no elevators, narrow doorways. So even if it's somebody who just has a walker and they manage to get up up the stairs, they can't necessarily maneuver easily. Um, the door handles are all those like really slippery round ones instead of levers or pushes. Uh, there's no electric, um, the accessibility electric doors, right? And they even go so far as to ban people with disabilities from the building. And then some time has passed that hotel gets sold to a new owner and the, the new owner is like, wow, that is so fucked up. Like lift the band, please come inside. The whole architecture is still built to exclude specifically exclude people with disabilities. Right. So I'm sure you can, you're we're, again, we're all smart. We can see the parallels. It doesn't matter who is the prime minister of quote unquote Canada. It doesn't matter who is the management of RBC. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, all of these institutions have been built upon the disenfranchisement of marginalized communities, specifically indigenous peoples. So until those systems have been decolonized, they are still damaging. They are still harming and excluding people. So when we talk about these, this idea of promoting well-being, inclusion, validation, freedom, I want I want that hotel analogy to really be at, at the at the back of your mind, or I guess even at the forefront. It's probably at the, back, the forefront of your mind. Um, again, this is a lot of writing. You don't really have to like look too much into it. You'll get these slides. So when we talk about promoting well-being, we're talking about promoting well-being instead of sickness and death. Promoting inclusion instead of exclusion. These are, they sound, for some people, they're like sickness and death. Well, that sounds really, really dramatic, Jen. 
Um, it does sound really dramatic, but it's not. Like, obviously, we have examples like residential schools, Indian hospitals. We even have COVID examples of Indigenous nations asking for help and receiving body bags instead. So, um, yeah, we still see that. We still see modern, quote unquote, modern examples of the state choosing sickness and death instead of well-being but if you're looking for like workplace examples we're also looking at like again that constant um productivity right one second we're looking at that like endless productivity this idea that i'm on my third coffee today i only slept four hours as if it's like a flex that we're killing ourselves for capitalism right like i i don't know why anyone i used to work at a call center and um, by the time I came in for my shift at, at 11, the people who came in at five, one of them had their third, um, like extra large, I think it was like a triple triple from Tim Hortons. And I was like, your third? At 11 in the morning, bro, come on, not healthy, not healthy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're basically, we're talking about giving people permission. Sorry. Just one sec. My God. I'm so, thank you. I'm so sorry. It just like, it hits like May, May was like, it's back to back to back workshops for me too. And I'm just like, really, really, of course, it couldn't be when I was like taking like a nice break. Had to be May. <laughs> it's uh, again promoting well being instead of sickness and death. Jen and her hustle culture, apparently. Um, but yeah, this this like hustle culture, right? This idea that like people need to be able to take care of themselves mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. What are we doing in our workplaces for the relationship perspective? Right? Are we are we villainizing emotional labor? Right? Are we only allowing that physical labor to hold value what are we doing to include the other perspectives different things like that and promoting inclusion instead of exclusion how are like people who don't face a certain level of discrimination don't naturally see it until their eyes have been open to it and then you start to see it everywhere right so what are you doing to help alleviate that disenfranchisement to dismantle that disenfranchisement and and i have down here like this you know, these systems are built for, specifically for white, cis, het, able-bodied men, specifically upper middle class to rich, predominantly Christian. You know, like we can add all these different, every single little title that or label that we add adds another level of privilege kind of closer to what the, the dominant demographic of, of quote-unquote Canada actually is. And just every little label that you add it's just a little bit more um, privilege that you would get. And every time you take that away, that's another level of access that you're taking away from the people who don't have that label. So if you can just kind of picture that, like if you look at that, that label, right, take away man, right away, half the population, that's half the population loses that privilege. That's a chunk of the population already that's down that privilege. And then you take away white. That's a huge chunk of population that loses privilege. You take away cis, like you take away all these little labels. And that's a that's a really good example of uh, like visual or even mental example of how you can kind of picture privilege being taken away from people instead of added, right? Because people don't, aren't able to necessarily qualify that addition of privilege because they don't necessarily feel it take it away then and and you'll start to notice like oh okay so maybe I'm not necessarily being given anything the other people have had it stripped it's different um in terms of validation and shame culture like I said this is shame culture is very prevalent in western culture um this is the idea that you are a bad person instead of you did something bad right when we want to heal a space, 
We need to be able to call the things that we are ashamed of into the light because shame lives in the shadows. And shame is a huge controller of our behavior, right? So we can't be vulnerable. We can't be innovative. We can't, um, we can't end things like lateral violence if we cannot call shame into the, into the light and actually hold it up for what it is because we're always going to be kind of afraid to penetrate that glass ceiling and show our true self. Or as Brene Brown puts it, um, we always have an armored heart up, right? So this idea of validating ourselves, validating each other and allowing ourselves to show up as we are, including as perspectives, it goes a long way. This is working styles. This is thinking styles, everything. Promoting freedom instead of oppression. Again, allowing people to take care of themselves right? Whatever that looks like. Uh, and then also condemning and dismantling these institutions that promote oppression, right? So I have down here um, microaggressions. I have it in quotations because like they're not micro. They they hurt people who experience them. It's just that they're called microaggression. And then also understanding that most most disabilities are invisible, right? So what are we, and, and most disabilities, people aren't just walking around talking about them because they are invisible. Are they, are they developmental? Maybe they might be intellectual. Um, they might be even like, like a digestive issue. We don't know. So just give people the space and the freedom to be who they are without having to explain it, right? Release that control over, over your space and over other people. Um, we'll talk about lateral violence just one second. Lateral violence is a special, a special, it's not, sounds nice, but it's not, is a, is a specific kind of violence that's rooted in oppression. Um, it's basically when a, a perpetrator feels so much uh, forces weighing down on them, whether that's from sexism, racism, homophobia, all sorts of different things kind of weighing down on them, that they turn their aggression outward to feel some sense of control and they lash out at people that they view as their peers or people that they view as lower down on them in, in the quote unquote like pecking order. So typically this impacts women, it impacts 2SLGBTQQIA plus people and it impacts children. Um, in indigenous communities, it impacts women and, and two-spirit children, sorry, women and two-spirit queer and children. So this can be things like bullying, verbal harassment. It can be theft, taunting, but I also like to say like in your meetings and things like that, it can be something as simple as like snickering when somebody puts up an idea. It can be something as simple as like rolling your eyes. It's any sort of action that makes you feel like you have control over a situation or over a person and makes you feel like you have a little bit more power, right? It makes them feel small. The idea is to make somebody feel small so that you can feel better. The spaces that are high in lateral violence and oppression have less creativity and innovation, right? So when I talked about shame culture, again, really briefly, but when we talk about shame culture, these are spaces that are high in lateral violence because people feel so ashamed of who they are that they want to take that aggression out on other people to feel better about themselves. The inverse is true as well. When we take down shame culture, we inadvertently take down lateral violence because those spaces, when we, when we say we have no room for shame here, when we only have space for validation, we only have space for creativity, innovation, love, validation, um, inclusion, well-being, freedom. The people who cannot get on board either fall off or they switch it up right? They have to step up their game. And so that lateral violence falls off. And so you start to see these spaces that are high in creativity, that are high in innovation. These are, again, safe spaces. So these are this lateral violence and, and shame culture, they go hand in hand, and they impact everybody's ability to show up with their best ideas. Um, I, I bring the lateral violence up largely because there is this it's it's tied to um, 
it's tied to racism, it's tied to homophobia, it's, it's tied to all of the things that come along with colonialism. And when we talk about reconciliation, we interact with a lot of lateral violence. But I also bring it up because what we're going to talk about next is vicarious trauma. And when we experience vicarious trauma, if we're not aware that we're traumatized, we may inadvertently participate in lateral violence to feel better about ourselves and to feel in more control. So even if you're not somebody who's experiencing things like, like oppression from, from outside forces, you may participate in lateral violence in order to feel more control over your space when you're by when you experience vicarious trauma in spaces that have lateral violence. So we'll talk about vicarious trauma. And I, again, I wish I could kind of delve into that a little bit more, but I have like a really strict agenda that I have to keep peeking at just so that you have like your journaling time. <laughs> um, but I do, like I said, I have the podcast and things. So for anybody who's like, I really want to dig deeper into this or anything like that, like, please feel free. Um, you can always look into it's. I've got lots of information. Um, but yeah, so vicarious trauma. Vicarious trauma is, it's again, it's something that's kind of like gaining leeway here. Like a lot of people are talking about it more in the past few years. This is the type of trauma that we experience when we learn about and empathize with traumatic experiences that others have faced. So our brains are very sophisticated, but they are not able to communicate with our body in a sense of like, I experienced this or they experienced this and I'm upset about it. And so our body and our nervous system start to interact with each other in, in very peculiar ways, they start to experience the trauma and embody the trauma as if we ourselves went through that experience. So you might see symptoms like hypervigilance, feelings of hopelessness, these numbing behaviors, fear, insomnia, all sorts of very bizarre um, trauma experiences. And you're just like, I, I didn't do, the, it didn't happen to me, what's going on? But your body, your nervous system is overloaded. It's traumatized. And I bring this up because when we are in reconciliation spaces, when we're learning about the true history of Canada and Indigenous peoples, it's very painful, right? Especially for people who are, are not Indigenous, who maybe grew up thinking that Canada was a safe space, and then they're confronted with the reality that, no, it's actually not. There are mass graves. There's, uh, you know, smallpox blankets, which my family has a tie to, uh, all sorts of really horrific information. And this this um, cognitive bias that Canada is a place that people can come to. There's no racism. You know, it's safe here. That just shatters. And there's a grieving process in that. And it really does traumatize your nervous system. So I always tell people, you know, you really do have to take care of yourself when you're working with traumatized ind individuals and you're hearing these stories, when you're reading these stories, um, when you're educating yourself on on the true shared history on this land. And then, of course, like when you're repeatedly exposing yourself to stressful situations or learning about them. And that, unfortunately, for people who are like, I love true crime, that includes true crime. Like I am somebody who I've had to just, this sounds really sad. I've had to like set a boundary with myself where I cannot, I cannot listen to the majority of true crime, but especially, especially MMIWG2S. And as much as like, I, like I can participate in it in real life, but I cannot listen to like podcasts on it. I can't watch um, documentaries on it. It's just too upsetting for me because I've, I've personally participated in like ground searches and like digging and things like that. And for me, that's already too, like that's already too close, right? It's already stressful on your body when you're like, what if I find something you want to find something, but at the same time, you're, you're hoping that you don't, but you're hoping that you do. And that's a really painful process. And then to listen to a podcast when you're at home cooking and you're kind of like, this feels weird to me, you know, like I just, I'm at home and I'm safe, but I'm, so I, I do just kind of urge people, take care of your bodies. If you're, if you're starting to notice 
you're having kind of weird anxiety at weird times of the day, just start start to kick up your uh, spiritual self care into into high gear. And usually, I do have like a huge chunk of like spiritual self care after this, but I I don't have time for it. So what I will say is, if you are like a reader, or if you're Again, a listener, I have episodes on it on the podcast, but I also have a blog post talking about different ways to take care of yourself. What I will say, though, is self-care is not like going to the mall and getting your nails done or anything like that. That, my friends, is capitalism, which is also fun. I love dopamine, but self-care is cleaning your spirit off. So we can treat ourselves like we can, yes, we're allowed to like go get our nails done and, and take care of ourselves and like wash our hair, please like wash your, wash your hair, have a good day. Like, but when I say like self-care, what I mean is like, you know, the smudge, if your culture owns the smudge or if it's been gifted to you, I'm talking about like sacred fire. I'm talking about, you know, gentle yoga, meditation, et cetera. The things that your spirit needs to get that negative energy off of you. And then you can think about the indulgence, right? Because the thing about dopamine is that it, you get a spike and then it crashes again. So if you go shopping and you have a great time, you're going to feel better for a really short period of time. And then it's going to crash again. And then you're going to have to do it again and again and again versus something where you're cleaning that negative energy off and really taking care of yourself. Then it's more of like a steady, like a, the, the bumps are smaller right because it's not related to dopamine although i'm like i said i too like to go shopping so no judgment i'm just saying it's not the same so um the final tool that i wanted to talk about before we go into the journaling portion here <clears throat> sorry this is the final tool on cultivating safe spaces and if we were in like the longer workshop again we would expand on all of this we'd have like breakouts and things but this is like this is like the the entree kind of thing for the the longer workshops this is the circle um the cultivating safe spaces framework is based on an alkin with which is a silk uh traditional knowledge system it's a decision decision making uh system that is radically egalitarian it is incredible it's it's based on the creation story how food was given, which again, if I if I had a lot of time, I would go into and I would I would get to talk about it. And it's amazing. I talk about the four food chiefs and things. Unfortunately, I don't get to do that. <laughs> um, but what what the who am I? What's in my heart? Portion is what what you can kind of take away from it is it's this idea that every single voice is as important as the voice before and the voice after in circle. And so who am I, what's on my heart is the part of the Cultivating Safe Spaces framework or the part of the workshop where we get to put everything that we just talked about into practice. And so we sit in circle, we practice discipline, we practice patience, we practice the four protocols, the four conditions, we, we, we practice promoting wellness, inclusion, validation, freedom. And I also urge people when I host circle, I also urge people to really like Hi, my name is Jen. I think I'm an action person and an innovation person. And then explain like who am I, what's in my heart. There's no theme for this portion ever. Um, because quite often some people will just say, thank you for holding space with me and move on. Other people might talk for five to 10 minutes and they might come clean about the fact that, you know, they haven't told their family that their grandparents are very ill or that maybe one of them passed away. And I've had that happen in circle where one of them actually said, you know, my grandpa passed away last week and none of their coworkers even knew. And because they hadn't, they hadn't set up their office in a way that that coworker felt confident even sharing that with any of them, they didn't feel comfortable saying that. And so this is the part where I'm like, see that we're exposing the, the weak spots in our in our space right you're learning more about each other and we're learning to hold each other in a sacred way we're seeing each other as spiritual beings we're seeing or 
again, if you're not religious, if you're not spiritual, as conscious beings, you're not NPCs, right? This is not a video game. I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. I kind of like go between maybe life is a simulation. I don't, I don't know. Who am I? But like, let's just operate on the idea that none of us are NPCs, right? That we're all spiritual beings. We're all conscious beings. That we're all expressions of life. And nobody really, I shouldn't say nobody. The majority of people don't walk through the day conscious of that, that you're not, as you go to pick up your order at Starbucks, you look the person in the eye and you're not just like, the light in me recognizes the light in you kind of thing, you know, like it's not, ah, thank you for my coffee. But I do, I, I hope that all of you, like after this, maybe you might start to think like that, that maybe when you get your coffee every now and then it might kind of jolt you and you're like, that's another human. Oh my God, that's weird. You know, and that, that even that jolt, once you start to look at other humans and you're like, huh that's really weird. It, it starts to, you start to see things, you start to move things, move around the world differently. Because once you can identify that that's another human that's separate from you, then you can identify that they're not separate from you, that we all come from source energy, whatever that looks like. Again, if you're religious, if you're not religious, if you're spiritual, if you're not spiritual, regardless, we all come from the same source, whether that's just atoms, or whether that's from, you know, creator, from whatever it's life is very very precious and I feel like a lot of people really don't take the time to sort through that and acknowledge that cultivating safe spaces is us slowing down and acknowledging that other humans are other humans and that we are just we're we're sitting in space with other humans and other beings I should say because plants and animals are also other beings that contain information and or intelligence and and autonomy that we don't acknowledge so this who am I, what's on my heart, sometimes it can take hours. <laughs> if, you're, if you're Elaine, she's sat in hours long circles. I think the longest one I've ever sat in is two hours, um, which was, it was, it was as, as an action person for me, that was a tough one. But Elaine has sat in ones that are like four hours long. And I was like, you are a gift. You are incredible. <laughs> um, but for people who are not, Again, they're not buying as deep into cultivating safe spaces. I also say, again, let's make this accessible. You could look at this as a SWOT analysis, look at it as like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But I add the caveat, we're not looking at weaknesses and threats as weaknesses and threats. We need to look at that as gaps, right? So we're looking at, if we look at the tradition and the innovation example again, if we look at it from a colonial perspective, we would say that the tradition and the innovation do not work well together because the tradition is just like, they're too slow. They don't want to change anything. That's a threat. They're so traditional. Like, Oh my God, they're going to be left behind innovations where it's at. And then the tradition people would be like, Oh, those innovation people, they take too many risks that, you know, they're, they're going to drive our company into the ground. Like we already have everything that we need. Those that's looking at each other as a weakness and a threat. Looking at each other as a strength or an opportunity and then looking at yourself as a gap and saying like you know what i i don't have that gift of like shoot the massive creative thought because my gift is knowledge knowledge storage or like uh, knowledge preservation and storytelling that's their gift that suddenly flips the script right so when we, even if we use a swot analysis we need to be careful with the words that we use. So the last little thing, sorry, the last little thing, did I cough at you and then mute myself? No? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, thank God. The the last little thing that we have here is this like journal and connect that Kasha really wanted to to leave you with it says that I'm spelling decolonially incorrectly and I, I really hope that I'm not because I've been spelling it like that for a long time and um that's it is what it is um but yeah so we we've got <laughs> we've got about I think 15 15 minutes if anybody wanted to well you've got about like five minutes to so just kind of like choose a question and like, think about it. 
And if and then there's like a an optional share back if anybody wants to like share what they thought about the questions or even like anything that you may have learned throughout like the presentation. So I'll go ahead, I'll mute myself and then if anybody like anybody wants to just like yeah. We'll we'll come back at ten forty six.
Okay. So what I think I'm going to do, I think I'll stop sharing here. And let me just, wait one second. I'm just going to re, oh, they're still there. Okay. Um, so the questions, if anybody, if anybody was wondering, um, maybe I'll, I'll just, I'll repost them here. Oops. I'll repost them just for anybody who came in late. Um, the questions are in the chat there. And if anybody, is there anybody who wanted to like share any response that they had? Or even if it's not from the questions, if they had any sort of like insights or any um, thoughts in terms of like what they learned about the presentation or just any thoughts or questions or anything like that. Just kind of like we've got basically like 10 minutes to kind of close out and just kind of like have like a little chat and share what we learned and expand on it basically. So if anybody has anything that they want to share, um, I don't know if you, if you wanted to do, you can either un just unmute yourself or you can raise your hand. I'm not like particularly, I'm not very picky. <laughs> Don, you can go ahead. You can start us off. Thanks. Um, and thanks for looking at my blank screen. I am also not feeling well today um, and I'm at home in bed. So I am, yeah, not presentable for your lovely faces, but I'm so glad I had the opportunity to still listen to this because this was a really amazing um, workshop and I look forward to listening to your podcast and maybe doing a later one. Um, but what I wanted to say is I, I took away a couple of things. I didn't answer these questions because they're so big um, for the time, but I did take away a couple of things today. I really have a new appreciation for relationship people and their the, the labor that they do um, and the connection that they bring. I I think I am a relationship person. And even I dismiss those qualities in other people and devalue them. Um, so I can really, I really see now how important that is. And um, having that patience for that and recognizing how important that role is and that it's not something that, um, you know, need in, in the culture, it's, you know, you got to squash it. You got to get work done. We got to move forward because I'm also very much an action person. Um, and yeah, so I just came away with a new um, appreciation for relationship people. And uh, I think that's going to be great. And I also, I mean, when you said going to the mall and getting your nails done is not self-care, it's capitalism, that really struck a chord with me because it's so true. And so many people think that way. And yes, taking care of yourself is important like that. And, you know, if you look and feel good, that is really important. But really, that specific context is capitalism. So I really love that. Um, and then my final thing is when you were sharing that one person in a circle, you know, they, did, they didn't tell their coworkers that their grandparent died because it wasn't like a safe space. I was thinking about I, how I run my weekly meetings with my team and, you know, I am pretty, you know, light and chill and I'm not super down to business, but I also don't necessarily foster that space where we talk about things outside of work. Um, and so that has given me something to think about and to bring into my meetings um, to make sure that we are fostering all sides of the person and not just the work person and giving people an opportunity to bring in whatever they want into the conversation, not just work. So yeah, much gratitude. Thank you very much, Green uh, Jen. I will definitely be subscribing to your podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's so kind. Um, yeah, we at so just so you know, at Next Meast at uh, Elaine's company, um, we always had one one meeting. This this is it doesn't have to be prescriptive like this, but we always had one meeting that was very much like relationship based, and then it was like a meeting that was all work based kind of thing. And so at the beginning of the week, we would be like, "What is your capacity? Did anything?" Do you have anything that you want to share, any wins, et cetera? And that would kind of allow us all to gauge 
where everybody was at and if they were able to take on extra work for the week or if they needed somebody to step in and kind of like take things off of their plate. So you might be able to build something out, even if it's like five minutes, 10 minutes at the start of each meeting to just have like a quick round table where you do something like that. Um, it doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be crazy. It can literally just be like a quick, how's everybody doing? You know, like, how's everybody feeling? And like no theme or anything. So that's what we did. Um, and Kelly, go for it. Hi, thank you so much for um, providing this workshop for us. Um, I uh, really, uh, it really opened my eyes to a lot of things. And um, um, I, I was looking at the different perspectives and and um, and how important it is to recognize, you know, the different perspectives from, you know, from, like, say, students, and um, and you know, like you mentioned that you know colonialism usually recognizes mostly people who are action. Yeah, so it might help to have that knowledge about the different perspectives for for you know our for our students and so I really that really made me think about you know how that would help students in in the classroom like um like you like you mentioned as well like somebody didn't feel safe about um, mentioning about their grand grandfather um, a place I worked at, um, the last place I worked at, we would have a short meeting in the morning and all the staff would sit around the table and we would just say how we were doing. And um, that really um, gave them space to say, hey, I, you know, um, this is happening with me or this is what I'm, I'm getting really frustrated about. Like one of them was people kept dropping in to see her she was a nurse and she was getting frustrated so we you know we came up with solutions to say hey maybe we'll have it um advertised that you'll have drop-in sessions every wednesday so it helped her so you know it really would help you know even if the instructors spend a few minutes on a monday or you know on during class time to say okay how's everybody doing you know so that would be, um, I think that would help the, the instructors understand where the students are coming from. So I really thank you for um, sharing your knowledge and um, pass my condolences on to you as well about your grandfather. I, I um, we're very sorry for your loss. So thank you for coming and sharing everything with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've, I have had teachers. Uh, I've had teachers who have had like the, the great check in portion. They also gave us option. My dog is like, why are you talking to the wall? Um, <laughs> I've, I've also had teachers who have had various options for um projects like uh to honor the different again different types of gifts like whether that would like how like how do you work like what is your working style um so for me like i, I i'm an essay person I, I love to write um i just i like to organize my thoughts that way but there are like certain people who would love to go interview people or they would love to you know drama king just threw himself on the ground um but you know they they'll have like storytelling aspects or maybe they might have like like different things that honor different gifts so that could be like another really cool thing to add in bye tracy thank you so much for coming um another thing to add in for the students would be like again honoring the different types of gifts the different types of working styles communication styles doing that check-in but then also being like there are different different things yes thank you so much Kara well we can um if there's if anybody wants to kind of add anything else we can we can do that but if everybody has to go that's that's totally fine 
like we can always close out early because we've we managed to finish <laughs> so oh debbie yeah go for it you're you're muted <laughs> Sorry, I'm also suffering with the head cold. And um, anyway, so I appreciate <laughs> your pain. Uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. I think this is the third time I've done this workshop. And every time I do it, I feel more, more grounded, more able to take on an aspect of it. And um, yeah, I love your idea of having choices for people to respond to their um, their abilities and to recognize their own their own gifts, especially if you're trying to create a cohort, and that will really help help everybody. You know, one place where I worked at three o'clock on Fridays, we used to have popcorn, and like every Friday, the receptionist would put on the popcorn, and then people would go over there and we would just talk about how the week was how the weekend was going to be. Is there anything we all need to think about for the week coming? And it wasn't like a, was sort of a planning meeting and, but not heavily into work. It was more gifting people their space. And you could just talk if you felt like it or just eat popcorn if you didn't feel like talking, but mostly it was super great for getting together and that was one of the most fun places I ever worked and I think if there was a way to do that kind of thing where we are now it would be really great but you need more people um more people who feel like they can spare the time like the action people they're just like popcorn eaters just go do your thing but where I worked before, it was small and everybody came. And so if you were a popcorn eater or not, everybody was there. Yeah, exactly. Just being able to set up. So, <laughs> he's like, we're done. <laughs> His name is Finn, by the way. He's just, he's like, hurry up. Um, being able to set up those spaces and, and um have people have people move in and out is really important the action people are hard to pin down though I will admit that um and Kelly did you did you have one thing to add before we close just find my unmute uh thank you so much Jen I um really enjoyed this session and I um I feel like I'm taking so much away from it um a couple of uh, key points for me were um about self-care and how that's more about um finding time to nurture yourself and to really reflect on uh those I think for me it's about reflecting on those daily activities that I'm doing um so automatically that I'm I'm not recognizing you know, I, I, I go out like a bulldozer. I'm a little bit of a, of the, of the action kind of person in some ways, but I also resonated with the, the, um, being part of the, the group for, um, communication and relationships. So I, I find I sort of sit on the fence or I fall to one side or the other. Um, I really liked the ideas around listening and not reacting or not listening to react or respond or pass judgment just to hear and let that person have the time to express themselves. Um, something I I've been trying to work on myself. Um, Debbie, I love the popcorn idea. There's no reason you can't make popcorn on Friday at three o'clock. And if you're the only one there the first week, I'm sure someone would join you the next. And it's something I actually want to start doing here because <laughs> and I love popcorn so <laughs> I, I don't know why we don't you know it should just be an automatic thing everybody makes popcorn on Friday um one thing I did really need feedback on was your the first question um about the fears that hold me back from doing decolonial work and I think for me it's about I'm a I'm afraid that I will appear to be insincere I'm afraid that I might offend someone that I'm not giving it 
the true um, understanding that, that I want to. And I have a fear of having to defend that with people that are not understanding or um, compassionate about the need for decolon decolonizing. And I don't want to miss something. I don't want to, on one, you know, in one sentence, I'm saying, oh, I really want to understand and, and, you know, help to fix this. But at the same time, I turn around and do something that is, is doing exactly what I think I'm trying to defend and I don't realize it. So um, I keep pursuing these workshops and trying to build better understanding. And, and um, I hope that I do appear sincere and in, in wanting to make a change and help be a part of the change. Can I just say something before you answer, Jen? Because I want to just yeah. say that something that Kelly brought up that I think is, um, you know, sort of a, not a fear, sort of a fear, kind of a worry. Um, you're not Indigenous. You can't be a knowledge keeper. You can't be a leader. You can't really do that because you aren't that. And I don't know. I just feel like, I don't know. Can I? <laughs> Yeah, I, I 100%, I understand there's, there's a lot of fear, like in the, in the workshops that I've done, just kind of, I'll, I'll do two parts. The first one, because I've got, I've got a book that I wanted to recommend to, to Kelly, so I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, There's, a, I've done a lot, I've done a lot of these workshops. <laughs> and a lot of the time, what what it comes down to in terms of like what holds a lot of settlers back is this idea of, you know, I, I don't feel like I have an identity in reconciliation, right? Like I don't know what I can contribute. Um, and to me, I think I, I find that very upsetting because reconciliation just in and of itself like the definition of reconciliation already requires two parties and so that in and of itself you have you you are a part of it regardless and I think that Canada as an institution has done a really good job of trying to tell people um of trying to tell people that reconciliation is only on the indigenous people's side and that you know it's our job to get over it it's our job to um, heal from it etc cetera, etc cetera. what they haven't done is also tell the story of you know this violent removal of cultures that have been stripped of settlers and so what i mean what i mean by that is Every single, every, every single quote unquote white person who has come to, I, I say quote unquote Canada for a reason. I talk about that on my podcast. I'm not going to derail myself here, but Canada in and of itself is a fallacy. There's a lot of like broken treaties. There's a, the, you know, the BC land question, et cetera. Again, I won't get into that, but I, I use quotes for a reason. Um, every single like white person in quotes who has come to Canada in quotes had to give up their identity and their culture and their traditions from where they originally came from to fit the Canadian identity and take part in colonization. So that in and of itself is a violence and that in and of itself needs to be addressed. And so there's a lack of identity for a lot of settlers that they are not aware of. At the, because Canada has tried to substitute the Canadian identity for them, which, like, what is the Canadian identity? Maple syrup and hockey? Maple syrup and hockey are both Indigenous. So, like, what what is the Canadian identity? What is it? We don't know what it is. That's the problem. And so there's this, there's a lot of confusion for settlers because what they thought was Canadian, this, like, happy place, where there's no racism, where we enjoy maple syrup, you know, we love the Canucks, we love the Toronto Maple Leafs, blah, 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 blah. All of these things turn out to be fallacies 
and they don't know what to do because ultimately they also don't have the ties to their their original cultures to their original lands because Canada as an institution required that they cut themselves off from that too to participate in the colonization here. And so what does that identity look like? What does that reconciliation look like? What we all need to do is rebuild our identities. How do you participate in reconciliation? You rebuild your identity. You relearn who you are. You relearn where your family is from. You relearn how you came here. You relearn all of that, why you're standing here. And that's how you can become a leader in reconciliation because Canadian is not an identity. Um, uh, oh, are you, you're headed out, Adam? Yeah, okay, thank you, Adam. Um, but Canadian is not an identity, unfortunately. It's a nationality. Right. So when we talk about this, how do we be, how do we participate in reconciliation, et cetera, et cetera. As a settler, you have to unpack where you came from because you didn't come from here. Um, and that insecurity of how do I participate in reconciliation? The cure is finding out who you are. And it's, it, that's the, that's where a lot of violence towards indigenous people stem from is that a lot, unfortunately, a lot of settlers who happen to be racist, um, not not settlers being, all settlers being racist, but settlers who happen to be racist, um, they understand without realizing it that they do not have an identity and they see Indigenous peoples with an identity and a claim to land and there's an insecurity in that. And so how do they feel secure? They take it out on other people. They take it out on the people who have a claim to the land. Because you're not making me leave. I have nowhere to go. Of course you have nowhere to go. But why do you have nowhere to go? You have to learn that story, right? You have to understand that. You have to have something to, to ground yourself. So it really is unpacking and unpacking your story and your identity. That's part of the understanding self. Why are you here? Right? How can you participate in dismantling Canada if you don't understand what Canada is made up of? And Canada is not just made up of harming Indigenous peoples, but Canada is also made up of harming a lot of people. Like it, it, it participated in harming Ukrainians when they came here, Irish people when they came here, um, Indian people when they came here. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people who have been disenfranchised when they came here who are now harming Indigenous peoples. <laughs> to try to have like a pecking order established and how do we dismantle that pecking order? We have to understand the pecking order and how it was established. Um, so that would be my, my roundabout way of saying like, how do you participate in leadership and reconciliation? You have to go back to your relationship to place and relationship to who you are. Um, and then Kelly, I have a book because it sounds to me <laughs> Like you might, you might get value from it. It's somewhere. Um, it's called uh, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. And what it does, I see an odd. <laughs> um, it is, it talks about how children are harmed by emotionally immature parents it talks about the different types of emotionally immature parents whether they are physically violent emotionally violent neglectful etc and then it talks about the two types of children that are created out of those whether they are um the, the type who are like i need to be better like it's me i'm the problem how do i how do i get better um internalizers i am one of those and then externalizers who are people who act out consistently um, they usually tend to be a golden child in the family so if you have a sibling who is like who can never do wrong um I do but that book cracked my world open and explained so much about the politics within my family um I would read that book because it explains like if you're a people pleaser, it explains, you know, um, any relationships that you hang on to um, that you may replicate from parental uh, like traumas and things like that. What I would say is if you have, again, that understanding self portion, if you're looking, if you have fears for participating in colonization and things like that, 
it's part of it's part of your identity that needs to be like Shrek cracked open off of that onion and held up and looked at right where is it coming from usually it's a shame that was handed to us from childhood whether that's a shame that was like Shh, we don't talk about it or it's a, again with like settlers a lot of the time like we don't talk about where we came from. My mom has no idea where her family is from. So I have to compl- I have to learn all about my mom's settler heritage now to honor that side of her family because she has no idea. We just know she's British. That's it. They don't talk about it. And then and then there's also the the shame of like you did something wrong so now you're wrong. You're a bad person. Right? So we have to kind of hold up those two things that were gifted gifted to us as shameless children um that's a good book i would read it it's very short too and if you're not a reader you can find you can find the jpegs online no that's great thank you for sharing that yeah yeah but i you hit some chords many (laughs) (laughs) almost too many (laughs) (laughs) like for an hour and a half i think um what i got out of it I i wouldn't have got out of you know some of the other workshops i've I've done four, you know, four, six hours and you know the value in what you've shared is tremendous for me. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I do want to be um, aware of other people's time. I, we've, we've gone over a little bit. So I understand if, it, if everybody has kind of places to be, I, like I said, I do have a podcast. It's, it is technically on hiatus right now, but I'm I'm trying to get back. I'm just waiting for my voice to heal because I've got I have bronchitis. I've got the, like the episodes and stuff lined up. I just need to be able to record them. Um, um, if I could just interject, just um, yeah. did you share that podcast information, or I missed the I, first few minutes of your? Oh, session. that's right. Yes. So the the podcast I have two. So there's the Cultivating Safe Spaces podcast, um, which is much smaller. It's just kind of the recaps of of these topics of the four perspectives, conditions, the protocols, um, why we need cultivating safe spaces. And then I have go smudge yourself podcast. Um, so those are, Uh are my two podcasts. And then I also have the blog. If you just go to ones, Oh, go smudge yourself. Are you froze? You froze. And I missed the second one. So what was that one? Uh, go smudge yourself. Sorry. (laughs) Go smudge yourself. Go smudge yourself. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, if you go to jengreenway.com, which I'll just put jengreenway.com. Uh, if you go to my website, it's all there. Like the blog, the, the podcast, um, at least go smudge yourself. Cultivating safe spaces was on uh, the cultivating safe spaces website. So we'll have to kind of, we're, I'm working with Elaine to kind of like figure out how we want to, oops, how we want to kind of do that moving forward. Cause she's working with a, licensing and and things like some legal stuff so we're kind of it's all like new coming up for like 2025 and things um but if you go to jengreenway.com all of that's there like there's there's a lot of information there so you'll be able to find like accompanying blog posts for the um for the podcast episodes and things and even if you just even if you go to ghost much yourself i think i've imported all of the episodes from cultivating the safe spaces on to go smudge yourself so you only have to remember one right now so yeah, yeah. thank you so much yeah so thank you uh, thank you everybody for coming um I'll, I'll go ahead i'll hit record or i'll stop i'll hit stop on the record <laughs> and um yeah i hope everybody has like a great wait wait oh chris. oh it was chris i was like <laughs> i thought <laughs> I thought it was a, I feel so silly. I thought that that was Adam again. And I was like, that was so creepy. <laughs> that was Crystal. <laughs> the screen was off. Okay, I'll hit stop.